Welcome to Mediation, the New Possibilities Hour. Today is July 9th, 2020. Our topic is cross-cultural negotiations as we see it. And we have two wonderful guests to speak to us today, two past presidents of the National, National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. First, we have Cindy Chang. Cindy is the managing partner of the Los Angeles office of Dwayne Morris LLP. And in a addition to being a past president of NAPABA, she is a past president of the Southern California Chinese Lawyers Association. George Chen, who is joining us from Phoenix, is a member of the firm-wide international board of Brian Cave, Leighton Peisner, LLP. He's the leader of the intellectual property practice group in Phoenix and also a past president of NAPABA. This webinar is part of the Will Work for Food project. We're here to raise money for food banks. This overall project has been organized by Natalie Armstrong and it's just a tremendous project. We've raised close to $35,000 for food banks so far. And uh, we hope that you contribute to a food bank if you like what you see. There's no charge for this webinar. With that, we'll turn it over to our very distinguished guests, Cindy and George. They'll let us know of food banks that are close to their hearts so that hopefully we will support those food banks. And we'll hear about cross-cultural negotiations as they see it. With that, Cindy, George, please, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I guess I'll start. Uh, my name is George Chen. I'm speaking to you from Phoenix, Arizona. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, Jeff, uh, Natalie, uh, thank you for that introduction. We appreciate everyone who's attending today, and we look forward to, to speaking with you. Um, with respect to food banks, my food bank uh, recommendation here for those who are looking for an opportunity to donate is a food bank that's located here and services the Phoenix metropolitan area. It's called Saint, <coughs> excuse me, it's called Saint Mary's Food Bank. Saint Mary's Food Bank, their website is firstfoodbank.org firstfoodbank.org. They have a lot of um, very uh, interactive programs uh, for, for children, and they have been around in the Phoenix area for several decades, and they do a fantastic job within our community. So if you're looking for somewhere to donate, St. Mary's Food Bank at firstfoodbank.org. Cindy? Cindy, Cindy you're I think on you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Hi everyone, um, glad to have Napaba sponsor this and also um, speak to Jeff Kachavin's group. Um, and I know that we have a very diverse um, group of people on this call. Um, I recommend that everyone donate to the local food bank that's you know special to their heart. Um, for me, um, we have one next to my LA office, the Salvation Army, but please, you know, thank you for participating. I'm happy to be on this call. And if you can, we encourage you to donate to uh, the, the food bank that's special to your heart. All right, great, thanks, Cindy. One sort of administrative thing we'd like to just let everyone know, although Cindy and I have some prepared remarks here, we, we recognize that many of you uh, probably have some questions and so feel free to ask those questions during the presentation. We will have an opportunity formally at the end for discussion, but more than likely it will probably be more informative, more useful uh, for you if, if we have more of a conversation as opposed to just a lecture. So if you have questions, feel free to ask those questions at any time. You can use the, uh, the chat feature I think, and, and Natalie, I think, is going to be moderating the, the, the questions. She's monitoring the, the chat questions that you submit. And when you do submit something, she will just um, interrupt us, or perhaps Jeff will. Somebody will interrupt us and ask the question, and we'll just answer it at that time. 
Uh, otherwise, as we said, there will be some time uh, structurally, formally at the end of our prepared remarks. So with that, we look forward to uh, having this discussion with you. So with that, yeah. let, me, let me turn it over to Cindy. So this is how we thought um, we'd lay out the rest of this program. So um, with this diverse group, we have some people who are up from Napaba and some people who come from the mediation background and who are in, in Jeff's network. And, and um, you know, we thought that maybe we take the first part of this um, segment to just really talk about um, Asian American issues. George and I are past Napaba president. We talk about generally understanding, you know, you want to call it like you know Asian American perspective and 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 cultural issues that are important to us. And then the second part, we really thought, you know, how do you leverage that in um, negotiations? Is there any particular tool, if, if at all, um, when you um, approach what we call quote you know cross cultural negotiations? So we we could talk about anecdotes. We could talk about ideas and strategies when you're in the context of negotiations and negotiations can be in anything. It can be in, you know, uh, a discussion with you and your, your spouse or it can be in mediation or some other ADR setting um, or, you know, in the boardroom. So with that, um, um, let's just, you know, set this up, George, and, and, uh, and I'll kick it to you. Okay, very good. Uh, so basically, one one thing that we'll mention uh, for Cindy and I, as, as uh, Jeff had explained, we are past presidents of, of NAPABA. For those who might not be familiar with NAPABA, it is a voluntary bar association, a voluntary organization for lawyers, a national voluntary organization for lawyers that focuses on legal issues that are relevant to the uh, Asian uh, community, the a APA community. And... Um, uh, the organization, the PABA, has, uh, you know, represents the interests of over 50,000 Asian Pacific American lawyers and judges across the country. And the Bar Association has over 70 affili affiliates, state and local affiliates, that comprise its membership and, and, and therefore represents those over 50,000 lawyers and judges across the country. And one quick thing, just so that, um, just to sort of give everyone a baseline, there are many different uh, phrases that are used to describe the, the Asian community uh, within, within this country. Some people refer to it as Asian American. Some people refer to it as Asian Pacific American. And other people refer to it as Asian Pacific Islander. And I thought it would be helpful just to explain a little bit of the differences between those terms, because some people within the, the, the Asian community in general uh, do see a difference between that. So Asian American, some people use that as sort of a pan, a, a pan Asian uh, term to cover um, all countries and cultures within Asia. Other people see it more narrowly. Other people will see it as more traditional, what I'll call Eastern Asian, which would be, for example, China, uh, Japan, North and South Korea, and so on and would not include the other countries and other cultures within Asia. The term Asian Pacific American is intended to cover the, the traditional, let's say, Asian, more narrow description of Asian, as well as Pacific Islanders. And um, Pacific Islanders would, would include uh, countries that would basically be uh, sort of between uh, the continent of Asia and Australia. And so you have typically the, the smaller countries that are in uh, smaller uh, Southeast Asian type of, of, you know, type of countries that are over there. We also have South Asian, which would be more like uh, India uh, and Pakistan and, and some of those areas. So the, the term Asian Pacific American or, or Asian Pacific Islander is intended to be more encompassing. Uh, because some people just don't consider Asian American to include all of those areas. But, but you know, Cindy and I, I think we, you know, we may jump back and forth between those terms, but it's intended to be more, um, you know, pan-Asian, let's say, and not specifically focusing on any particular culture or country within Asia, um, unless we're specifically identifying that. So just wanted to sort of set that, set that background, you know, the difference between Asian American, South Asian, Southeast Asian, Pacific Islander, and so on. Not, not to make things confusing, but just to let people know that there are um, 
uh, what some people might consider nuances, but I would consider them important nuances if that's how you wanted to characterize it. So uh, with that, why don't we uh, turn it over to a more general discussion of um, uh, understanding some, some a Asian Pacific American or Asian Pacific Islander stereotypes. Cindy? Yeah, sure. So with very broad brush strokes, I mean, you know, we, George and I are brought on and, you know, we're both N past Napaba presidents and, you know, stereotypes are stereotypes, right? So, um, you know, with Asian Americans, you know, we, we often face challenges of, you know, being meek or, or humble or, you know, you know, um, coy or, you know, you know, bad drivers and <laughs> this and that. And, 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 um, and you know, we, we suffer too from what we call the model minority myth is that, especially in the, in the legal setting where um, Asian Americans can be considered hard workers and, you know, worker bees that are very smart and intelligent. But um, what the problem with that is that it's, it's a myth and that it really doesn't, take into consideration, you know, the other challenges that, that, um, that, um, you know, uh, minorities have. It's, it's a, you know, a model minority myth and, and not really understanding that we are a very diverse group of um, Asians. And I'm talking specifically Asian Americans because mostly everyone on this call is. And, and so, um, you know, in the legal profession, especially for me in the law firm setting, I see that um, how that plays out is when one is, um, for example, advancing in the, whatever the, you know, from associate to partner and stuff, you often see that Asian Americans um, suffer from, you know, being relied on to be the good worker bees, but when it comes to promotion and um, becoming a partner and being relied on for a book of business or being a lead on a case or um, being the ones that they're going to take to introduce the clients, the challenges um, um, occur at that point in time in the promotion level. And so you see um, numbers of um, larger amounts of Asian Americans in associate ranks and then seeing them drop off in numbers as you go higher in seniority um, to partner level ranks. So I only bring that up because we are all, all mostly in the legal profession and thought that um, you know, we could talk about some of that and how that might play out. Um, but in the in the greater community, I, I did want to just give like a quick, 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 um, you know, summary about just you know Asian Americans in general. Um, right now, you know, in the times there's uh, we're dealing with COVID and we're we're you know you know this this virus that we're we're ha we're having. There are references as if as the Chinese virus, Kung flu, or the Wuhan virus. Um, and I know that that has come from, you know, the top levels of our government and there's been some retraction of that, but it still continues. And, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, the brief history, of, uh, briefly about, you know, some of the historic racism that has occurred against Asian Americans. And, you know, constantly we as Asian Americans, you know, are dealt with as the perpetual foreigner. And regardless of, like, for example, myself have been here for, my family's been here for over five generations, um, continuing to have comments about, you know, go home to your, you know, country, when, you know, the only country I've been in is in the United States. And, you know, some of these things that are going on today where we're really talking about racism um, gives us reminders of um, our Asian American history, going back from, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1800s, when the entire national group was, was blocked from immigrating to our country. Um, and we have, for example, xenophobia after 9-11, when there was, you know, hatred uh, against Muslims or South Asians. And, and you know, let's not forget about during World War II, when we rounded up the Nazi, 120,000 of them um, and incarcerated them in internment camps. Um, because of their Japanese ancestry. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of history. And um, I think back to the 1980s um, when there were, you know, like Japanese auto groups were doing very well. And there were incidents um, that, one of them being the Vincent Chin incident. Um, Vincent Chin was um, 
in Detroit, and in 1982, he was murdered by, and, and actually bludgeoned by, um, bludgeoned to death because he was blamed for putting auto workers out of a job. So, so that really did spark, um, you know, an Asian American movement um, from that incident. And, and it just really reminds me, like with all the protests going on now, that we really think about um, um, that history from Asian Americans. So just wanted to put that backdrop. Great, thanks, Cindy. What, I'll add one other thing. Uh, Cindy, you mentioned the, the, the model minority myth, and this goes back to my earlier comments of really there's you know, different segments of the Asian community in the United States. And the model minority myth, if you break it down, it really applies more to the traditional East Asian communities because those folks um, are historically, let's say, the first immigrants. And those folks are the ones who maybe have been here for you know, let's say up to five or more generations as, as Cindy's family has been. And so uh, those folks, uh, you know, are, again, we're, again, we're referring more to the Chinese, uh, Japanese, uh, South Koreans, and, and so on. And it's not so much, the model minority myth, if you look at the demographics, does not apply, actually, to other, um, uh, other uh, segments of the Asian Pacific American community. And in, in particular, let's say the newer immigrant communities, which generally are more on the, uh, uh, not the traditional, um, uh, not the traditional uh, East Asian communities, but rather some of the other, uh, other communities that I had mentioned before. And, and the model minority myth, if you look at the, the demographics there, does not apply as much. And so there are, there's a very, uh, for lack of a better term, diverse um, population within the Asian uh, community within the United States. So with that, we thought we would talk a little bit about um, a, a Asian culture or Asian Pacific Islander culture and communication and how that would affect uh, negotiations, mediation, and so on, because uh, communication obviously is, is, is how we're going to conduct, conduct these negotiations. So I'll just at, at the outset mention three, three, um, three, three things. One is uh, saving faith, which I think most people are familiar with that concept. Second is humility, which Cindy had mentioned earlier. And thirdly, I'll mention is con contextual. It's a very, con most Asian cultures, at least that I'm familiar with, are very contextual. And so let me go into that a little bit more. So saving faith, I think most people are familiar with, it's about providing an out, right? Not requiring the other side to be embarrassed, to be publicly shamed, or anything like that. It's all about preserving the reputation of your family, of your parents, your grandparents, and, and so on. So I think that is probably fairly well understood, but if people have questions about that or want to talk about that further, Cindy and I would be happy to do that. Secondly, I mentioned humidity, or humility, and Cindy had mentioned this earlier, and this includes things which are perhaps a little bit more uh, subtle. They can be verbal cues, they can be nonverbal cues as well. They include things like um, it's actually disrespectful to look someone in the eye if they are your superior, right? So if you're meeting the CEO uh, of a company, if you're the mediator and you're meeting the CEO, right, and, and it's somebody from Asia, right, who's very traditional Asian culture, you know, you, you should consider, you know, you may want to look at them, but then, you know, you want to look basically at their shirt or at their shoe or your own shoe, right? That is a sign of respect. Um, it's very different, obviously, here in, in American culture. Um, uh, from a verbal, uh, a verbal cue standpoint, humility expresses itself in terms of, you know, for example, if somebody asks you, you know, can you do this, right? The, the more traditional Asian way of responding is to say, I'll try. Even though you know you can do it, and in fact, even though you know you've done it one million times, you will still say, I will try. And that's not to be interpreted as, I'm not sure if I can do it. Although some people who are lo looking at things on a more literal basis, they may interpret that to mean, I don't know if I can do it. Or in a negotiation context, if you ask someone, look, we would like this settlement term, you know, they may say, they may say, I'll think about it. And uh, I, you know, my family, we joke about it when someone says, I'll think about it. That's what we call the Chinese no. Right? Because they won't disagree with you to your face. They're indirect. 
and 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 so that you know that that's another sort of uh, contextual type of thing um, uh, is, is to not disagree because disagreeing could cause the other person to be embarrassed and lose faith and so you don't you, it's culturally you just you don't say no but in a negotiation context right if, if someone's saying uh, I'll think about it and if they're if you if, if they are really uh, communicating in a, in a more traditional Asian style, then it, it's highly possible, uh, you know, that they're really saying no. And so you shouldn't say, think of that as, well, maybe there's a chance, so I'll, I'll keep pushing on this, because you're, you, you probably won't get anywhere. Um, from a contextual standpoint, in addition to the, you know, not saying no, it's actually, at least in, I'm not sure about other Asian cultures, but in Chinese culture, if, if somebody asks you a question, you could say, Yes, I agree. But to, to say yes, I agree even more strongly, you would say you are not wrong. So saying you are not wrong in Chinese is actually a stronger way of saying yes, I agree than saying directly yes, I agree. And this is all about sort of the indirect way that, that uh, many Chinese people, and I think I'm pretty sure many other Asian uh, cultures will, will communicate. Um, the last thing about contact context is, and this again is more focused on Chinese, but the, the concept of sarcasm does not exist in, in Chinese. And, and it's because Chinese is, um, uh, no matter which dialect of Chinese you speak, it's spoken in uh, single syllables. Like every word is a single syllable. There's no, there's no multi-syllabic uh, words. And every single sound, every single syllable, single syllable sound has four pitches or four tones. And each of those tones means something different. So just as an example, ma, 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 ma. Those are four different words. Ma is uh, your mother. Ma is, um, uh, 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 is uh, like numb. Ma is a horse. And ma is to scold, right? The last thing you want to do is call your mom a horse. But in any event, um, because you have these these different tones, you can't use tone to indicate sarcasm the way you do in the United States, right? In America, in general, or in English, in general. So, just these different concepts of communication are are important to understand when you're dealing with someone who who is communicating in that style. And then the last point I'll just mention here is just just because we look Asian, Cindy and I look Asian, but as Cindy said, she is fifth generation, right? Her, her family has been in the U.S. for five generations. My family uh, has been in, the gener in, this, in this country for only three generations. I'm second generation. My parents immigrated over here in the United States. I was born here and my children were born here. But, um, you know, so I, I consider myself having more American culture values than, than Asian cultures, but I, I grew up, right, in a, in a Chinese household. So I am very, very familiar with these Asian cultures. Um, but just because someone looks like me doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna be communicating in this way that I just explained because they may be, you know, fifth generation or, or, or more, or, or they may be able to easily adapt between two different cultures, American culture and Asian culture. So these communication styles um, are, are, are very, very different and it can be very important in a negotiation context. So I think I went a little bit long there, but in any event, let me turn it back over to Cindy for the next topic. Yeah, so we can start jumping into, um, you know, thoughts about negotiations and trying to understand um, the other side. Um, but before we do that, I, I do want to take one minute, and I'd be remiss if I didn't, to just going back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, Asian Americans now in America, um, is is to talk about you know the racism that's been increasing especially in this COVID environment where um there has been and it's been confirmed by the fbi that that there have been a rise in hate tax against asian americans because of the from um, uh, the flu being from an asian country and um um uh, you know, there's, there's, um, uh, you know, statistics that are showing that. So, um, you know, we, we all must remember that, that, you know, this, this virus does not discriminate. It can affect anyone globally. It's, it's people that discriminate. So with that, um, 
and again, I remind the group, please let's have a conversation. Let's talk about different hypotheticals and everyone else, you know, share experiences. Um, that would be great to have, you know, questions posed. Um, so with, with respect to how I think about negotiations, um, the assumptions I make and whoever's on the other side is actually no assumptions. Um, I think it's, uh, it, you just don't know, um, you know, for example, let's just say we look at the other side and look at Je uh, George and he's Chinese. Um, you know, if I had not known him, I wouldn't know, you know, if his background was, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, Taiwanese, or um, if he um, came from, you know, the countryside or his family was more wealthy and came from, you know, um, suburban city and, um, you know, dialect, religion, and all the other layers of complexity that make a person, um, it, you know, I, maybe I don't even know he's Chinese, it could be mixed of, you know, uh, other Asian ethnicity, you know, Korean, Japan, whatever, South Asian. And, and so I think that it's all better to have the new symbol and you have preparation and you take your cues during negotiation to really, really come from the first point, which is understanding your other side and listening. And I think that requires empathy. Um, um, and, and I've read, you know, different kinds of negotiation books and, um, you know, one, for example, where it, you know, tries to address cross-cultural negotiations categorically and say, okay, if you're dealing with an American, um, these are, you know, American stereotypes. For example, they're aggressive, they assume a zero-sum game, and, and so forth. Or if you're dealing with a Chinese, they could be sly and they may hide the ball, and, and, and so forth. And, and, and I think that perhaps that could be part of your tool set. Um, or to, uh, but again, going back to what I was originally saying is that you just really have to understand there's so much complexity in, in understanding the other side. For example, George and I may be alike in that we're both Chinese, but I might have more affinity with him and what might be a better leverage tool in trying to understand where you come from is we might find out we came from the same law school, for example, and that might be the actual common denominator that brings us together. <clears throat> so, um, with that, I guess, I, um, uh, you know, I was also thinking about what, well, what kind of, um, way, what kind of tool can, can one then try to understand the other side? And maybe it's not looking at them from a visual standpoint and trying to assign, um, certain traits because of what nationality they come from or where they live but it's actually looking at them from a human level so um in some of the books i read and by the way one of the actually the book that i like the most is um it's written by someone named chris voss and it's um what was the name it was um never split the difference um, i really like that book and he talks about you know you need to look at the other side is at, a, at the human level um and you know there are there are three categories basically of of types of people and personality types so one is the fight type um uh you know aggressive and i want to kill you kind of you know assumption the second is the flight type someone who tends to escape and want to retreat and the third is the more gregarious accommodating type and obviously people can have combinations of of a mix and a mixture of either and <clears throat> that might be a way to look at the other side and 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 you know look at them from personality type so um um i george and i were talking about okay let's let's talk about situations of you know if you're uh, if your adversary is, you know, diverse or Asian American, or when your neutral is diverse or American, or when your client is is 
um, Asian American are diverse and, you know, what have we learned from that and what can we share? So, um, let me see. So maybe I can, uh, sorry, did I, does someone have a question? Yes, there, there is a question. Um, the question being posed is, does the cultural context George discussed inhibit the Asian American community from speaking out against racism, potentially leaving the erroneous impression of tacit agreement or permission to continue? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll respond first. Cindy, you may, you may have some other thoughts as well. I, I think um, culturally it, it, it does. And part of this is, uh, I think if you look at uh, many of the, um, uh, if you look at many of the Asian cultures and, and sort of look at what environment those people are living in uh, within Asia, many, many of the, the, the government uh, over in, in these Asian countries, uh, there are certainly exceptions, but many of the governments, including China, are very, um, you know, they, they, they have a lot of control, let's say, and some might consider them to be very heavy handed in how they uh, rule the country. And so uh, because of that, many, many people in, those, in, these other, uh, in these Asian countries will grow up sort of trying to just stay low, right? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an expression in Chinese that says, the nail that sticks up gets hammered, right? So basically, culturally, you don't want to necessarily stand out because there could be bad consequences. And then similarly, to respond to the question, um, you, you may not want to uh, speak up because that makes you stand out. And so, you know, that's also part of the, the humility um, sort of culture. And again, that's very, very different within the US. And so I think there have been, uh, th there is a change now as we have more um, let's say as, as Asian Pacific Islanders are in the living in the U.S. for more and more generations, they uh, just become, let's say, more American. They're embracing more American values, and and are speaking up more so. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say that I think the Asian American community has, from that perspective, has benefited from the African American or Black community within the United States. Um, the, the Vincent Chin uh, incident in the 1980s up in Detroit that Cindy had mentioned, who, the, the, the Chinese person who was assumed to be Japanese and was bludgeoned to death for supposedly putting all the American auto workers out of uh, jobs. Um, that situation, at least as far as I'm aware, was, was one of the first where the African American community um, uh, basically assisted and stood up for the Asian American community with protests because the people, the two individuals who, who had bludgeoned to death uh, Mr. Chin uh, were, were not convicted. And so uh, it was actually the, the African-American community, the black community that, that had come to, to rally support for the Asian American community. And so there have been, you know, since then, I think there has been a, a um, sort of a, a growing movement, I'll say, where, where uh, Asian civil rights are becoming more, uh, Asians are becoming more vocal, let's say, about their civil rights. But Cindy, additional thoughts? Yeah, and you know, two um, areas that are really important that I can think of that I may see where um, Asian American engagement um, is so important yet also challenging, and that is one is in voting. So, uh, and the second is in the census. So. Um, with regard to this concept of, you know, are Asian Americans active enough and engaged and, and speaking out um, and, and making their voice heard, with respect to voting, I, I think that um, there have been, um, you know, political groups that may not think that the Asian American vote is significant enough to really talk to our communities and and really engage because we don't have or we don't wield as much influence at the ballot box. And, you know, as George has indicated, we're working on that to, you know, increase voter um, engagement. And, and it may be culturally where um, 
you know, going to vote and you being um, of immigrant roots and not really, um, um, you know, I don't know, cons you know, you know, I don't know, thinking that um, come from some other country or, or, or whatnot or not really um, um, assimilating. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that certainly um, we've, we've done a lot of work, especially in Nepal and, you know, and, and other um, related organizations in, in making sure that we are heard and there are a lot more um, um, accomplishments over the last few years of um, Asian Americans also in high levels of politics. And the second is the census, which has just occurred recently. And um, there, ha there was concerns as to um, uh, immigrant communities being so scared that if they go and actually register to have their voice heard, um, you know, they, there might be, you know, whatever backlash against them and, and their community in, in having, you know, being deported or, or so forth. And, and, and um, that's, that's, you know, actually contrary or counterintuitive in that no, you know, us as Asian Americans, we do need to be counted because that's exactly how you allocate funds to the communities of, of color. So, um, you know, cultural passivity has been a challenge, but certainly not something that um, is not improving and that we need to be continually vigilant about. Okay, all right, great. Uh, hopefully that answers the, the question. And if there's follow up with that, please certainly let us know. But um, Cindy, did you wanna go back to what you were talking about? Yeah, we were just going to talk about different, you know, situations. Um, uh, uh, I have some clients that are, you know, Asian American, and I have some clients that are, you know, Asia, Asia, um, and and certainly I've, you know, learned. Um, you, well, you know, obviously there's the very obvious differences of like uh, language differences and and so forth. I, I find that. Um, respect is is um, actually the best tool <laughs> that I've found that um, learning and, and understanding the other side often I personally um, listen more than I talk and um, I think that really does break down barriers um, in terms of letting the other side be heard but um, when um, you know, my client is diverse or, you know, from Asia, I, I, I do realize that, um, um, like, for example, in the fee setting, you know, arrangement of fees, I know a lot, some of my Asian clients prefer to have more certainty. They might not understand the um, American, like, hourly rate system that firms and what cap fees arrangements. I think, like, more often than not, I ask, you know, I have clients that ask for capped fee arrangements or um, in their budgeting. And if you're a litigator like myself, um, that's very hard to predict and hard to work with. But um, having, you know, Asian clients and having, you know, Asian offices, we try to really understand those cultural needs um, and try to work out alternative fees. Um, let's see, when, um, you know, oh, George, when, um, Oh, do you have any thoughts on on that with your clients being um, Asian American? Yeah, with with clients, I think um, it, it, again, it depends sort of how American they are, right? I mean, if they're really traditional Asian from Asia, don't have too much exposure to the American culture, there are just things that are that are different. And, and as I was explaining earlier during the seminar, um, just things you have to be aware of. I'll give one example where, and it, it was it was it was my fault in this case because I did not prepare my client uh, sufficiently, um, because I thought right I made I made a stereotype of my own client who was Asian. I thought my client was more American than than he really was, and so when we were in this uh, 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 settlement uh, negotiation, uh, my the other side had proposed a particular uh, settlement term. And, 
you know, my client basically said, oh, I'll think about it. And, and I, you know, so then I, afterwards, right, I asked my client, I said, well, does that mean no? And, and he, he was even just like, well, I didn't, it means I'm thinking about it. I'm not really sure. But I could tell from his response that he really wasn't that interested in it. But as the settlement continued over the next, you know, several weeks, sporadically, the other side, apparently, that, that particular settlement term was very, very important to them, very critical. And so they kept pushing on it because it was important to them. And they had heard directly from my client, um, uh, you know, from, directly from my client saying that he would, he would consider it when, in fact, he really wasn't considering it. Right, and so we we had to just overcome that communication issue uh, to ultimately reach a a settlement that that everyone that all all the parties agreed to. So I think um, certainly you know when when uh, and so I learned from that experience that you know not to make assumptions, my own assumptions of my own Asian clients um, as to as to sort of what communication style, how American, how Asian their communication style might be. Um, Cindy, you, you had a story, I think, when we were preparing for this seminar, you had a story about, about selecting a neutral in a, in a very, I think, unique situation. You want to share that with the group? Oh, yeah. Um, thank you for reminding. Yeah, so um, I'm, uh, you know, was, uh, so I'm leading a litigation team, and it just so happens that um, everyone in my team are Asian American female litigators. So there's uh, three of us. And, you know, it just worked out. It was the right people for the team, the skill set, the capacity, and so forth. And it's in um, arbitration. And we, you know, lots of times, you know, uh, on the law firm, law, law firm front, we're, we're trying to make teams more diverse. And in this case, we had a very diverse team. And we brought it up as a group and said, is this going to help us or hinder us in the best services for our clients because we're all Asian American females and how will that affect any impressions that we have with our neutral. And um, we really at the outset kind of put that at top of mind and one would think, you know, why, you know, this is the people that have the right substantive skill set. But it is, you know, certainly coming from a minority female perspective is something that you know, you have to think about because when you walk into a room and you're representing your client's interest, you don't want that to be the distraction in um, the substance of what you're advocating for. And um, we really did do a deep dive in all the, on all the neutral selected to see and maybe even made some of our own assumptions based on what you can get, like, you know, looking at bios and videos and articles and getting feedback and you know had to extensively interview people and say do you think he'd be open or do you think he would he would have some um unconscious bias against us because you know asian americans may you know like for i know for me like they think i'm young you know i'm you know, you know they, they think that you know, I'm petite or, or whatever, and and I might not be the commanding white male presence that one may stereotypically think of as the head of a litigation team. But um, it it was very important to us to to do our prep work, and we looked at bios of um, neutrals to say, okay, you know, what is it in their bio that might um, make them maybe more open to us? Do they've got you know international practice? What kinds of matters have they handled? Are they you know where, where, where you know what areas of um, uh, uh, in government or or you know, where you know where they practiced or where you know where they where they prosecutors where they this like you know what side I mean we really did some like trying to do some psychoanalysis and whether it's 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 right or wrong it's just trying to get information we looked at their bar associations what organizations they were in you know do those organizations embrace diversity and inclusion. So um, it was just interesting and um, certainly um, something to think and consider, especially if, you know, you're um, coming from a minority background and selecting a neutral. George, did you have any anecdotes you wanted to share? Uh, yes, actually I do, but I, I noticed uh, just kind of peeking at the clock here, we've got a little bit over 10 minutes. 
uh, left in this seminar. We want to respect everyone's time, so we do want to end at the top of the hour. So th that's, you know, Cindy and I have more or less completed our, 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 uh, our prepared remarks. So if folks have questions, feel free to please use the chat function. Um, if, we, if we're a little bit more uh, shy of a group, I I've got some stories, uh, and Cindy, I'm sure, has more stories that she can share as well with respect to um, uh, negotiations, perhaps mediations, arbitrations, and so on with respect to um, you know, Asian American issues. Yeah, and there, there's a question um, that was just posed. A question? Yes, it says, can you share what are some challenges you personally faced along the way as an Asian American associate to making partner at your respective law firms and how did you overcome those challenges? Okay, uh, Cindy, you wanna respond first? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> um, um, it's been challenging from, from day one to today. Um, and I, I continue to say that as an Asian American female, and it's why um, I continue to, to, to um, advocate on behalf of um, Asian American uh, women in the law. Um, I just felt that, you know, despite um, my success, I continue to, um, um, from day one, um, try to overcome um, cultural stereotypes. So I shared the story with some of my Napaba colleagues, but even when I was a first year associate, I almost left the practice of law because I was at a small firm. I was the only Asian American female. I was a, a cog in the wheel um, and uh, um, definitely working, worked hard, but I was told by the partner who was at the head of the letterhead um, that I would never become a trial lawyer because I was, you know, too meek um, and not aggressive enough. And, you know, certainly that lit a fire under me to eventually become a partner. And I continue to have cases where it's either other opposing counsel or it's, um, you know, judges or it could be anyone from like the bailiff that will just make assumptions about me if I'm, you know, the secretary or the court reporter or some cases, you know, I've, I've had um, opposing counsel say very, uh, you know, uh, dismissive terms um, about me. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been a struggle. And, and now, even when I'm um, managing partner, I, I still face challenges in, in trying to, um, you know, um, you know, have my voice heard on um, for example, I'm on our partner's board. Um, I'm one of the few um, minority females um, on the board. I, I, was one of, I was the first, and now we have others. Um, and it's intimidating in that you're um, one of just a handful, or if not the only in a group of um, predominantly white and male settings, and you sometimes question whether you know, am I a token here or do, or am I really heard? And, and, um, and when you have decisions made about you that are um, perhaps not, you know, favorable, you, you have to always think to yourself, okay, is it because of this reason or is it because you may have some unconscious bias against me? Um, and so, so I, I think it's been a struggle um, from day one to, to today, and I, I, I um, you know, we're a resilient group, and we continue to try to be eyes wide open and, and trying to figure out, you know, how can I um, learn from this and how can I overcome this? George? Yeah, so, yeah, so sure, I'll, I'll share some things as well. It, it certainly has, has been a challenge, I'll say. Um, you know, for, for me in, in, uh, in, in my Phoenix office, you know, when, when I joined, there's not, a, there's, well, there's not a lot of Asians in, in Arizona in general. Um, and so there's not that many Asian lawyers in my Phoenix office. Although now, uh, sort of uh, in, in an unusual set of circumstances, you know, I, I'm a partner in our Phoenix office. I'm on the international board of my, my firm, one of 15 uh, for a while. I was the, I was the first and only uh, Asian American on our board, and we now have two, which is fantastic. But in our Phoenix office, our office managing partner also happens to be uh, uh, Asian as well. So, so th 
situation is very different now than when I joined the firm uh, 20 years ago or so. But um, you know, some of the challenges that, that, that I face, I think, are, are pretty typical in terms of uh, people uh, just sort of making uh, initial, you know, having certain initial impressions about who you are, what you're capable of, and what you'd be best suited for in terms of job assignments. And for me, it was more about, you know, just making my, uh, you know, just talking, talking to the partners, talking to the senior associates who are assigning the work and letting them know, look, I've been doing this for a while. I feel like I've, you know, come a long way, come up on my learning curve. I'd like to do something, you know, I'd like to do this other thing, you know, and just asking, making my, my um, desires known. I always tell associates now that, look, the best person to look out for your career is you. And you need to figure out, you know, what the, you know, if I want to make partner here at this firm, um, you know, what, what are the requirements? What are, what are the accomplishments uh, of recent partners? And sort of you can pattern it after that, you know, have some open, honest conversation with, with partners to, to ask, you know, are you really on track? Just because nobody says anything, no news doesn't necessarily mean good news in this context. So, you know, those types of things. I, you know, like Cindy, I, I'm, I'm also a, a litigator, but my practice is more on the intellectual property side, exclusively on the intellectual property side, but I also have an intellectual property transactional practice, helping clients obtain patents, trademarks, and things like that, in addition to litigating them. But in, in a litigation context, I, you know, even I'm 50 now, right? And, and I still have this situation where opposing counsel, they're not familiar with me, may, may assume that I'm going to be meek, I'm going to be quiet, I'm not going to object. And so many times I will have to, you know, I will let them know up front and early that I will object. I may object, frankly, more than I should, but just to let them know that I'm not going to sit here and be quiet. Um, if, there, if it's not on videotape, I may, I, may, uh, I may shout at the opposing counsel initially just to get the point across, don't make these assumptions about me. Because I, I would just I just want to set, start off on the right foot. Um, I, I have a story where I was a I think I was a fourth year associate at the time, and this this very influential rainmaker had decided that he wanted me to handle this copyright case for one of his uh, smaller clients. And it was a it was a three party. Um, it ended up being a three party mediation. And it, I was the only, you know, there were nine people there um, at the mediation, you know, sets, three sets of lawyers, three sets of clients, and the mediator. And I was the only, uh, frankly, non-Caucasian person uh, in the room or in the rooms. Um, there was a time when the mediator brought us all into the same room. And uh, it, apparently, you know, the, the other two parties had reached some sort of tentative agreement and just said, well, uh, you know, George's client could just pay the difference to the plaintiff and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just be okay with it. And so as, the, as we're all in this room, I could tell like everyone was kind of ganging up on, on me and my client and my client was, was, was more elderly. Uh, and so, uh, she, you know, she didn't, she didn't say a whole lot. So w once I realized, and I, you know, once I realized that, that they were trying to just, you know, they had already, uh, at least from my perception, had already kind of agreed this is what's going to happen and, and George's client is going to pay the difference and it will be done. Um, uh, you know, I, I basically first was very polite and said, look, this is not re rational. My client, frankly, shouldn't even be here. We told you this from the beginning, reasons one, two, and three, you know, it's in our mediation briefs, blah, blah, blah. And they just kept insisting and just completely ignoring what I was saying. So finally, I, I basically threw a fit, right? It's like 1 a.m. in the morning, right? We're still in this room. And I basically pounded on the table and I stood up and I pointed at every single person and I said, you are not listening. We are not paying. And, you know, if, if we're going to go to trial, let's go. And then I told my client, we're leaving. So well, we didn't leave. We just, you know, went into our, our separate room. And then, you know, my client was very nervous. Said, are you sure that's the right approach? I said, just let's see. We came in, mediator came in and said, okay, they've agreed. You're not, your client's not paying anything. So, I mean, it was just, it was just one of those things where I really think that they had thought that, well, you know, here's this young guy, right? He looks like he's 15 um, and, and he probably doesn't have much experience. Well, they probably saw my bio, right? I was five years out of law school. Um, and so we could probably take advantage of the situation and, and because, you know, I'm Asian and, and so on and so forth. And I just, there's just times when you have to um, at least in my experience, just do the complete opposite and maybe go a little overboard to 
make sure that the other side doesn't uh, doesn't miss the point. So anyway, um, let's see here. I think we're doing okay on. Oh, we're almost out of time, actually. Yeah, we um, have a little, little less than five minutes left. So if you two would like to make some concluding remarks, I think that would be great. All right, Cindy, would you like to start us off? Sure. I just my couple points. I'll just you know say that um, just you know remember that um, those of us who are very well versed in the diversity and inclusion space, you know, understand how important that is and that there are studies and statistics that confirm that diversity on your teams um, is so important in, um, and actually leads to better results and better decisions. Um, and, you know, as, as we were talking about before is, you know, while these are, while these are important, well, we and well, we live our life experiences, and we deal with different kinds of situations. We and we understand, you know, Asian American backgrounds and the diaspora and 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 cultural difference and so forth. We always, always do need to understand. You can't assume um, um, something on the other side, but you do have this large tool set to to to, to inform your um, ultimate. Um, assessment of who you're dealing with but you start with listening you start with empathy and you do some preparation and then you go to your toolkit to help you inform yourself on how you approach whatever situation you're dealing with and um, you know if you've got Asian American colleagues and you're in the pandemic please check in on them um, you know and 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 if you see xenophobia or so forth, please denounce that in the way that you think is appropriate for that particular situation. So thank you um, for having me. Thank you. George, please. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick here. I, I think we're just about out of time. I, I agree with everything that, that Cindy said. I think, uh, you know, listening and empathy and, and just being, um, you know, being a good supporter, uh, regardless of whether you're, you're uh, Asian uh, American, Asian Pacific Islander, or not, just being being supportive of of the issues you know, that uh, our communities are facing. The other thing I will say is that you know seminars like this, and you can read books. You can you know there's a bunch of YouTube videos on on these kind of cultural differences, and are certainly many articles published on the internet about the same topic. But I will say there is no substitute, right, for actually experiencing it. There is no substitute, and just reading about it, hearing about it is good, but there's no substitute for actually experiencing it. And so I would encourage those of you who are, who are attending this seminar who uh, maybe don't have much experience with, with uh, people of, of Asian or Asian Pacific Islander descent to, to, to go and experience it, whether that, um, you know, once this pandemic is over, um, you know, taking someone out to lunch and just finding out about their experiences, what was it like growing up? And, and I think that will give you a much better appreciation for how to communicate and how uh, uh, Asians uh, who, are, who are more Asian than American would be communicating as well. So I would encourage you to, to go out and, and experience that as well. So Jeff, turn it back over to you. Thank you. Natalie, we have one slide. Our speakers have provided us with their contact information. So if people would like to follow up with any questions, Cindy and George have very graciously made their contact information available for people. Let's wrap up by saying thank you, first of all, to Cindy Chang and George Chen for an excellent presentation this morning, to the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, NAPABA, for being the co-sponsor of this seminar and helping us raise a record number of people attending. Natalie, thanks to you for organizing the Will Work for Food project. We're at about $35,000 raised for food banks. George had mentioned firstfoodbank.org in Phoenix, Arizona. Cindy had mentioned the Salvation Army. Please support those food banks if you wish, or any food bank. They all do a wonderful job of helping to fight food insecurity. And with that, Natalie, back to you. 
Jeff, thanks so much. Uh, George, Cindy, really powerful presentation, greatly appreciated. Um, I would just like to add one thing, uh, to encourage Americans to get a passport and use it. One of the best ways that you can um, be involved, be tolerant, be empathetic is to experience uh, any number of cultures for yourself um, personally, face-to-face, -face, uh, appreciate their music, appreciate other cultures, appreciate other foods, appreciate other histories. So get a passport and use it. Thanks very much. Okay. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. We are complete.